Today, we will talk about motion of electric charges, a fundamental physics effect that occurs in numerous forms, both in nature and technological applications. We see motion of electric charges all around us. Chemical and biological processes involve motion of electrically charged atoms and molecules at the microscopic level. Prosperity of humanity and success of modern technology critically rely on our ability to create and control electric currents. We will work out several equations that are widely used to describe electric currents in a wide range of situations. Here is the basic situation that we will consider. Imagine a piece of material with potential difference delta V applied across it. The potential difference creates electric fields inside the material. Every material has huge numbers of charged particles that can move relatively freely. Typically, these particles are electrons and ions. The charged particles will start moving under the influence of electric field. So we could find motion of each charged particle by applying the Coulomb's law that we have studied. In practice, such calculation will be very difficult because the number of particles is so large. So here is the path that we are going to take. Instead of using equations for forces that lead to very complicated calculations, we will rely on concepts of potential and potential energy that simplify calculations tremendously. We already applied theory of electric potential to study the ability to store charge or capacitance. When studying capacitance, we assume that charges do not move or are in electrostatic equilibrium. Of course, charges always move at the microscopic level, but we did not see any pronounced motion of charge from one part of the conductor to another. When the net charge does not move in any observable way, the total force on the charge is approximately zero. This implies that the potential is approximately constant throughout the whole conductor. We also discussed capacitors, devices for storing charge, and calculated their capacitance. The situation that we will discuss today is quite distinct. We will assume that there is a pronounced motion of charges in the material and consider the electric currents. As charges propagate through the material, they bounce off the atoms of the material and effectively encounter resistance to their motion. If there is no external force to push the charges through, the charges will gradually lose their net velocity because of the constant collisions with the atoms that they encounter. In order to sustain a non-vanishing current, an external force must be applied to accelerate the charges and counteract the resistance. Furthermore, the potential is no longer constant and changes across the conductor if there is current flowing through it. Any electric circuit that sustains a constant current must include a device that creates an electromotive force to push the charges. One familiar device of this kind is a chemical battery. Batteries do not store charge, but rather separate positive and negative charges and move them around. Inside the battery, the chemical energy is converted into kinetic energy of the current that leaves the battery. The current carries this energy to other devices that are connected into the circuit. So let us consider a simple electric circuit consisting of a battery, capacitor, and an electric switch that we discussed before. The three elements of the circuit are connected by brown wires, which are typically made of metal. In metals, most of charge is carried by electrons, which can move inside the material relatively freely. Electrons are shown by blue balls inside the wires. When we close the switch, they will start moving because the battery pushes them from upper plate of the capacitor to the lower plate. So let us try to do this now. We will close the switch. Here we are. We see electrons moving from the upper plate to the lower plate. After a while, the motion of electrons stops because the potential difference created by the battery is 
balanced by the potential difference of the electrons and the deficit of electrons of the upper and lower plates. Let us examine the distribution of the potential in a little bit more detail. We will discharge the capacitor and measure the potential differences among different points using our voltmeter. So suppose we measure the potential across the battery. We see the potential difference is equal to about 10 volts. However, anywhere on the either part of the battery, the potential difference is zero because there is no current flowing through the wires. There is also no potential across the capacitor. If we now charge the capacitor, the potential across the capacitor goes up as the capacitor charges. After a little while, the potential difference across the capacitor is exactly the same as the potential difference across the battery. The potential difference between any two points of the wire is zero because there is no current that currently exists. However, if we disconnect the battery, let's quickly do that, and create the, the current in the wire by discharging the capacitor, notice that potential in the wire becomes non-zero as long as the current goes through. Here we are. The stronger the current, the stronger the potential difference. Let us now see what happens if we connect another type of electric device, such as a light bulb, to either battery or the capacitor. In the first case, when the light bulb is connected to the battery, the battery sustains electric current for a very long time. This happens because the chemical energy that is stored in battery is converted into energy of motion of electric charges in, inside the wires or the electric current. As electrons travel through the light bulb's filament, they lose some of their kinetic energy through collisions with atoms of the filament. The heated filament releases light that carries away energy of the electric current. This way, we convert chemical energy of the battery into energy of the electric current, which is later converted into energy carried away by light. In contrast to the electric battery, a capacitor does not have an energy source of its own. All it can do is to store energy temporarily as long as it is charged. If we connect an uncharged capacitor to the light bulb, nothing happens. There is no current in the system. On the other hand, if we first charge the capacitor, it will store significant electric energy inside of it. If we now disconnect the battery, and connect the capacitor to the electric bulb. After closing the switch, we will see the current. The current will only last uh, until the capacitor is fully discharged. In the end, the total energy stored in the capacitor was converted into the energy of the heat in the light bulb. 